So we pick up today's discussion, leaving off after the, the end of trading uh, between Japan and uh, the United States, and a continuing rise in tensions. Despite these rise in tensions, um, and despite the, the fact that these countries are now economic enemies, like we are, we are freezing each other out economically, there are still negotiations. American ambassadors are meeting with Japanese ambassadors, and they are discussing things. But these discussions are going nowhere. Because ultimately, yes sir, okay, ultimately what the Japanese want is for the United States to open up trade with Japan again and to stop aiding the Chinese that the Japanese are fighting against. Whereas the United States say, we will only stop aiding the, J the Chinese when you get out of China. You have to get out of China first. And then we can consider opening up arms ship or shipments to you again or stop aiding the Chinese. So neither of us are going to budge on those things. The Japan, Japanese say we've got to stop arming the Chinese. We say you've got to get out before that happens. So nothing is going to happen. We have, however, been able to decipher Japanese encryptions for almost 20 years. Back in the 1920s, we figured out how to read Japanese encryption so we could decode Japanese secrets. And because we can read and understand some of the things that Japanese diplomats are sending back and forth from Washington DC to Japan, we get wind, we understand that the Japanese plan to cease all negotiations by November 25th, 1941. And as no agreement before that point is reached, we know, even though Japan and their ambassadors are still talking, we know that Japan has already made up their mind that they are going to act. And we're pretty sure that an attack is going to come from Japan. The only issue is we don't know exactly where or when it's going to be. We think we're leaning towards the fact that the Japanese are going to attack the Philippines. We think that is going to be the primary attack. Yes, sir? Oh, I was just wondering what was the year? 19, or this is all the fall of 41. 1941. So we know that Japan is done negotiating for real. We are quite sure that they're going to attack. We just don't know exactly when and exactly where. And as we said at last class, we know the Japanese are going to attack because the Japanese have to. In their war plans, the Japanese are going to continue expanding through Asia, where they're going to run into colonies of Britain, and Britain has got the most powerful navy in the world, though much of it's tied up in the Atlantic. They've got the most powerful navy in the world, and the United States is a formidable foe in the Pacific, and we have a lot of assets and, and holdings in the Pacific. And the Japanese are concerned about fighting both the United States Navy and the British Navy at the same time. It's that old avoiding a two-front war, even though we're not going to have defined fronts on the oceans. So Japan's hope is by launching a surprise attack at an American naval base in Hawaii called Pearl Harbor. Has anybody ever been there? Cool, very cool. Um, yeah, we'll talk about it in a moment. This is, this is a photo of Pearl Harbor on the morning of the attack. You can even see here... We have a Japanese plane that, that's been caught in the photograph, and you've got some water uh, spraying up in the air, explosions. Uh, Pearl Harbor is, is a, the base of America's Pacific Fleet in Hawaii. And it's quite a long way from California. Like, our next naval base of operations in the Pacific is San Diego, California. So Japan's hope is that they could deal a crippling blow to our Navy at Pearl Harbor, and it would be so devastating that the United States would not be able to wage a war against Japan. And if we can't wage a war against Japan, we would be out of it. We might have to open up trade, you know, negotiate some surrender with the Japanese, open up trade with them again, and then the Japanese can focus on taking British holdings in Asia. That's the plan. Yes? They, they were out to sea. Yes, they weren't there. So that's going to be one thing that's going to help out um, the United States in the long run. So here's Pearl Harbor, and I want to show you also what it looks like from above. 
This is a satellite imagery of Pearl Harbor. This is not like a big open harbor to the ocean, all right? This is a very narrow channel that gets you into the Pacific Ocean from Pearl Harbor. You can see some naval vessels here, and you can see a lot of the dry docks or, or, or docks for the ships down here. So this is all Pearl Harbor, um, but that's the narrow exit from Pearl Harbor. The Japanese hope was to cripple American ships inside the harbor and also, to their hope, close off the harbor. Maybe they can sink some ships in the mouth of the harbor so ships can't get in and out for a long time to come until that can be cleaned out. And that would shut down Pearl Harbor uh, going forward. And the attack comes on the morning of December 7th, 1941. December 7th, 1941. It is a complete surprise to the Navy uh, at Pearl Harbor. In addition to attacking Pearl Harbor, the Japanese have simultaneous attacks on Hong Kong, it's a British colony, Singapore, another British colony, Malaya, another British colony. What's that, Kevin? They didn't get the Singapore Okay. Um, and then also attacks on, on Midway Island for the United States and in the Philippines as well. So this is a major operation by the Japanese. The impact of the Pearl Harbor attack, it will be a crippling of the United States Pacific Fleet. But as Evan already said, thankfully for the Americans, our aircraft carriers were out to sea. The aircraft carrier in World War II is the lifeblood of the Navy. And our aircraft carriers were away from the harbor. So none of them are going to be sunk in the Pearl Harbor attacks. None of them will be trapped in the harbor. That narrow channel was not blocked. So the harbor would remain open um, even after the attack. But the attack nonetheless is devastating. Uh, you guys might be familiar with this, and those of you that have been to Pearl Harbor, you've probably been to this. Ms. Prentellis, were you on this? Did you go out there? Yeah. yeah. So this is um, the memorial for the USS Arizona. It's one of the battleships that was sunk um, at Pearl Harbor. And you can faintly make it out in this image. This is one of the, the big gun turrets uh, for, the battle, uh, for the Arizona. Uh, so the ship is still under the water, and it's probably one of the most like moving memorials that I've ever been on. Um, and you guys I pr probably would feel the same way. Because uh, what is the Arizona still doing, Mr. Harrison? Leaking oil. Yeah, there's, so for the last 70 years since it's been sunk, every, I don't know, I can't remember the duration, but every minute or so, a little drop of oil rises to the, the surface of the water and then dissipates in its little oil slick rainbow. Um, and, and it kind of gives you this weird, eerie sensation that there's like life in the ship because there's hundreds of lives that were in the ship, and they're, they're entombed now in the ship, um, and that is their final resting place for those sailors who, who went down with the ship. So that's the USS Arizona. It was a devastating attack, uh, but the most important aspect to this attack is they didn't get any aircraft carriers, they didn't close the harbor, and it did absolutely cause the United States to enter the war. And I want you to listen to what Franklin Roosevelt had to say. Members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation, and at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. 
Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleague delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute <laughs> With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us God. Um, you want to take a quick second to recognize to recognize how neat that is? Oh, goodness. That that video and that audio exists because, of course, before Franklin Roosevelt, you know, we have some images of these presidents and we can see their speeches printed up in newspapers, but we don't hear them. Um, and so now, and now, you know, Barack Obama is on TV every day, and we're seeing him give speeches every day, and it's, it's just second nature. But there was a time in American history when hearing our leaders didn't happen, and it wasn't too long ago. World War II, now radio is a thing. By the 1940s, television is starting to become a thing that people actually can have. Um, and so, we're, or people are going to see these at, at movie theaters or whatnot. Uh, this is new, and people can, leaders can now directly speak to the American people. Um, so what Pearl Harbor does do is it draws America into the war. On December 8th, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, is when we declare war on Japan. And so does Britain. So does Britain. And then, of course, because Japan had already signed the Tripartite Pact, which obligated Japan and Germany and Italy to all joined together if the United States ever was at war with one of them, Germany and Italy will also declare war on the United States. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, one of the reasons why Britain also joined the U.S. is because they were their ally and because they were attacked. Yeah, they were attacked as well. Yep. And, remember, Britain wants help in Europe, right? Britain, Britain, Churchill has been waiting. You remember the Atlantic Charter was way back in August. Britain's been waiting for something to happen that will get the United States in the war in Europe, and this is absolutely it. We recall um, in December and into January of 41, 42, we'll have another meeting in Washington, the Washington Conference, where Britain and the United States will talk with each other, and they will decide that despite these Japanese attacks, what's going to be the first priority in the war? Germany and a Europe first strategy is laid out. That does not mean that the United States will not be fighting a war in Asia. Um, right off the bat, in early 1942, the United States is going to engage in two major naval battles with the Japanese. The first that we'll talk about is in May of 42, called the Battle of Co the Coral Sea. The Coral Sea Battle. Battle of the Coral Sea. And this is north of Australia. Yes, this is the northern tip of Australia. Coral Sea, May of 42. I, I'm May, whatever. It's not crucial. What, I, what is crucial to understand is that early in the war, 1942, this is months after, after Pearl Harbor, uh, early in the war, the United States is going to be engaging in naval battles with the Japanese. So the Japanese want to continue pressing in Asia. And Australia is their goal, and the Battle of the Coral Sea is what stops the Japanese advance into Australia. At this battle, which is like, if you're interested in trivia kind of stuff, it's the first naval battle in military history where the navies fighting each other never saw each other. Our ships never saw their ships, their ships never saw our ships. 
This was an aircraft carrier battle. So the airplanes from our aircraft carriers met the planes and the ships from Japanese aircraft carriers. But American battleships were not squaring off against Japanese battleships in this battle. The era of the battleship, that was World War I and before. Now battleships have been replaced on the open seas and in primacy with, with aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers are everything. And with that, that's why the Coral Sea is a victory for the United States, because we sunk two Japanese aircraft carriers. We lost one. But that, that balance is even more damning towards the Japanese when you consider they lost two, we lost one. It sounds pretty even, Stephen. But we, what's that? We have a far greater capacity to produce new aircraft carriers during the war than Japan does. We have more resources, we have more available labor, and we aren't being bombed ourselves, which we'll talk about in a little bit with, with Japan. Shortly after Coral Sea, we have another battle on the open seas called the Battle of Midway, another naval battle. This one is in large part due to American cryptography. We knew that the Japanese were planning an attack at Midway Island. Despite diversionary attack, uh, uh, naval ships uh, from Japan heading up towards these islands. Anyone know what these islands are? The Aleutian Islands. These are like, this is Alaska. It's kind of crazy that Alaska is on the same map as Hawaii here. But that's Alaska, right? But we knew because we had broken Japanese codes, and this is where we remember that wars are fought by guys on front lines, but they're often won by eggheads behind the scenes crunching numbers that can break codes. We knew that the main Japanese fleet was heading towards Midway. And so we met them there head on. The Battle of Midway is considered by most to be the turning point in the war in the Pacific. So if like the Battle of Stalingrad is Germany's turning point and everything went south after that for Germany, in the Pacific it's going to be the Battle of Midway. Japan will lose four aircraft carriers to one American aircraft carrier. They'll also lose 50% of their fleet at the Battle of Midway. And again, Japan can't keep pace with the United States when it comes to building new ships and replacing uh, pilots. From here, the United States has stopped the Japanese expanse in Asia. And we can now begin making our way towards the Japanese mainland. And we're going to take a look at, oh, here's a photo from uh, the Battle of Midway. So you can see what a naval battle in 1942 would have looked like. And that there are actual ship-to-ship -ship combat in, uh, at Midway. So we get to the Pacific Campaign for the United States after the battles of Coral Sea and, and Iwo Jima, or pardon me, um, Midway. And the United States military will now engage in what's known as an island hopping campaign. Again, we're talking about American military strategy and now the Pacific. Remember the Allied strategy in Europe was North Africa, while, while the Soviets are fighting in, in the east, North Africa, hop to the soft underbelly of Europe, and then prepare for an invasion of northern France. That's the strategy in Europe. The strategy in Asia is we've got to make our way from Hawaii, push west, and slowly but surely get closer and closer to the Japanese mainland by hopping one little island that's occupied by Japanese military after another little island that's occupied by Japanese military to another little island that's occupied by Japanese military. Every one of these little islands we go to, we have to do another amphibious invasion, another amphibious assault. Some islands are easier to take than others. Some are absolutely vicious. The goal is to get close enough to Japan where we can send bombing runs on mainland Japan and those ships can come back and refuel and then go bomb and come back and refuel and then go bomb. So you take these islands so you can get to these islands. You take these islands so you can get to these islands. You take these islands so then you can get to Japan. 
One side note story, you don't need to write this down, but immediately after Pearl Harbor, the United States um, wanted to immediately strike back against Japan. And so we, uh, we had some American pilots fly from, and, and Kevin, where did, where did they take off? Where did Doolittle's Raiders take off from? Was it Pearl Harbor? No, no. no, no they, they, where, they, it was like southeast of Tokyo. Okay. But they, they didn't have enough fuel to get, to get all the way back. And so they, they had to fly over Japan. And, and so they bombed Tokyo and then had to keep on flying into, into Japanese-occupied territory in China and get uh, to safe territory beyond that. So our goal was to get close enough to Japan where we could bomb and then return and reload and bomb and return and reload. And this is our island hopping campaign. There's dozens of islands we're hopping to. Two in particular that I want you to be aware of are Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Iwo Jima you guys all know because you've seen this image before. This is uh, a photograph of some Marines raising a flag on top of what's called Mount Suribachi, the high point on Iwo Jima. And this photo has now been made in the statue, into the statue that is now the U.S. Marine Corps Memorial at, uh, in Washington, D.C., at, at Arlington, I believe it is, right? Is that, that Arlington? Is that, is that on the mall? It's, it's not known, but it's like, I think just outside of the city. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's at Iwo Jima. And what we're learning through these island hopping campaigns are that these battles are ridiculously fierce. Even when the Japanese have been defeated, or seemingly defeated, they're not surrendering. When the German soldiers that were fighting in Europe are surrounded and they're done for and they, they're, they've, they've all but lost, they put their hands up and they surrender and they become prisoners of war. And then we treat them according to the rules of war with regard to prisoners. We, you have to feed them and clothe them and keep them, uh, keep them safe uh, from, from harm. In fact, there was an interesting radio lab program a month ago. I'll, I'll tweet it out to you guys tonight about, I believe it was in Montana, um, a prisoner of war, a German prisoner of war camp um, in, in the western United States. I want to say Montana. Um, where essentially the town was taken over by Germans and they had a good old time for the, the, uh, the year, couple years that they spent in the United States. They had parties and stuff and they had a lot of fun. Put together soccer teams. Uh, yeah? Iwo Jima, I-W-O-J-I-M-A and Okinawa. O-K-I-N-A-W-A. So what we're learning with these island hopping campaigns and these small battles that we're, that we're engaging in, many times large battles, is that the Japanese soldiers aren't surrendering. We're also having experiences on the open seas of kamikaze pilots. And these are those pilots in Japan, because they were short of trained pilots, that would be taught to take planes, to take off in planes, but never taught to land, because they don't ever need to land. The planes will be used as guided missiles into American ships. And so we're, we're creating in our mind a myth and a, an absolute reality of the, the enemy that we're fighting in Asia. And that is one of an enemy that is not surrendering, an enemy that is not stopping the fighting even when all seems lost. An enemy that would rather kill themselves, whether it be kamikaze pilots or, or Japanese soldiers committing seppuku where they, like, you know, the old samurai way of, of killing yourself, um, or going out with grenades, or Japanese civilians running off cliffs because they're afraid of being taken by the Americans. Um, we are seeing the Japanese not surrender, and this is blowing our minds. And it's absolutely going to have an influence on the end of this war. By the time we get to, uh, by the time we get to Iwo Jima and Okinawa, we are into 1945. And now we can start active bombing campaigns of the Japanese mainland. On March 9th, 1945, this one night alone, the United States launches an air raid on Tokyo known as Operation Meeting House. Operation Meeting House. We launch an air raid on Tokyo on March 9th of 1945 with primarily incendiary bombs. A couple different types of bombs that we'll talk about. Most bombs are explosive and concussive. They cause a big blast and they knock down walls. 
incendiary bombs are meant to ignite things on fire. And we start using incendiary bombs in Japan because, as opposed to, for example, Europe, because European cities are made of brick and concrete and mortar. There, there still was firebombing, but we, we used a lot of other bombs as well. Uh, but here in Japan, where it is primarily, primarily wood and a lot of paper walls, incendiary bombs were used. This is a photograph of Tokyo. This is a photograph of Tokyo after this uh, March 9th bombing. The United States would kill an estimated 80,000 Japanese civilians on this night. 80, wrap your head around that. 80, 000, the attack on Pearl Harbor cost about 3,000 American lives. We burned down about half of Tokyo on this night, um, and, and that was about 80,000 Japanese civilians. And of course, many that are going to survive, they're left homeless. We do this not only to, to Tokyo, but we do this to dozens of other Japanese cities. Yes? Not much at the time. There was not a lot of goodwill towards the Japanese. And, and we have to remember, too, at the, the time of war. Do we recall, we mentioned the other day, what the Japanese were doing in China? The, 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 there, there was very little concern for civilians on any side of this fight. Uh, and ultimately, this, this is interpreted in many different ways. Our military leaders saw that that doing this kind of thing, as devastating as it was, is what you needed to do to get Japan to surrender in the war. And surrendering in the war would keep us from ever having to invade mainland Japan, which could be even more devastating to the people of, of Japan. Yes, sir? Was Operation the entire firebombing campaign strictly Tokyo? I think it was just this one Tokyo night. Um, so Japan is now defeated on the seas. Japan has been defeated in the air. The United States has absolute air superiority over Japan. And we will continue to bomb Japan into, hopefully, submission. Yet they don't stop. They don't stop. While this is all going down, in April of 1945, the United States is going to get a new president. Franklin Roosevelt dies his vice president, Harry Truman, takes over. And as Harry Truman becomes the president of the United States, he now learns about the capabilities of the United States nuclear program. We have had scientists for the last four years that have been working on developing an atomic bomb. And they're very close. This is called the Manhattan Project. We'll talk more about this on a later date. We're very close by the time Truman assumes the presidency. In July of 1945, Harry Truman is in Germany. We're going to talk about this meeting in Germany at our next class. But in July of 45, Harry Truman is in Germany, meeting at what's called the, uh, the Potsdam Conference at the end of World War II in Europe. The war in Europe is over by July of 45. And at Potsdam, at Potsdam, the United, while Truman is in Germany, the United States will first successfully test an atomic bomb in the desert of New Mexico. It works. We didn't destroy the world, but we absolutely made the most devastating weapon that had ever been created. Truman gets news while he's in Potsdam that we now have a working atomic bomb. And now Truman has a decision to make. What do we do to get out of this war? Truman is left with a number of options that he could choose from. He could invade Japan. The military had already been working on war plans. What was known as Operation Downfall. That was to come in November of 1945. That would involve an invasion, an amphibious invasion, of mainland Japan, the big islands of Japan. And this invasion would be devastating. It would be Normandy on steroids. Because not only would you be fighting against Japanese defenses, but virtually every Japanese civilian also is considered a part of the Japanese military and has pledged their lives for their emperor. 
So we feel like we wouldn't have to just fight the military, we would have civilians coming at us left and right. Estimates range, but Harry Truman was, was told by his advisors that it could cost upwards of 200,000 American soldiers to successfully defeat Japan with an invasion. That's about half of the guys that we lost through the entire duration of World War II. So, or more than, more than half the guys we lost in the entire duration of the war. And that's not even counting the hundreds of thousands or millions of Japanese civilians that would have died in this invasion. So that's option one. We're not starting off with very good options here. Option two, negotiate with Japan. We're already burning city after city after city after city to the ground. Maybe Japan will negotiate with us for an acceptable term of surrender. Something that they can agree to, something that we can agree to. But on the flip side, what did we say long ago at the Casablanca conference? Yes, sir. Unconditional surrender, Unconditional surrender is all we would accept. No surrender with conditions. Would we accept a Japanese surrender if they still wanted to hold on to some of the territory that they gained in the war? No. I don't know. So that's an option two. Try to negotiate with them. Get out of the war. We could wait. We could wait and cross our fingers. Because one thing we know by July of 1945 is that the Soviet Union is just about ready to launch an attack against Japanese holdings in Asia. The Soviet Union is going to help out in Asia. We're going to talk more about this in a couple days. We know the Soviets are coming. So we could wait. And maybe the Soviets coming in might convince the Japanese to surrender. But there's another side of that coin, too. If we let the Soviets come in, they'll never leave. And we know that they're ultimately never going to leave because North Korea is still North Korea, or, or in effect, never leave. North Korea is still North Korea today. Um, but that's, a, that's another, another story that we have to consider. Because we know the experience in Europe. Soviet armies have, have liberated Eastern Europe, and they never left after they liberated. So that's an option. We could do a test run. We could drop an atomic bomb over Tokyo Bay and show the Japanese what we have, show the world what we have. Or Harry Truman could use the bomb on a civilian population of military importance and he could end the war immediately. Truman ultimately chooses that last option. We'll talk in a couple days and look in a little bit more deep all the choices that he had. But he chooses the last option. At Potsdam, at the Potsdam conference, Harry Truman gives Japan a final warning. He says that Japan must unconditionally surrender or they will face what he says is prompt and utter destruction. Japan does not surrender. On the 6th of August, 1945, on the 6th of August, 1945, the United States will drop an atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb ever used on civilian populations in human history. And well, uh, August 6, 1945. We drop it over the city of Hiroshima. Do I have my Japanese students now uh, scoffing at my pronunciation? That's how you say it? Hiroshima? I say Hiroshima. You probably say potato too, right? Who's in Japanese class? You study a little Japanese, right? How do you say it? I think it's Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Okay. I've always stretched it out, I guess, a little bit. Anyway, August 6, 1945, we drop a bomb on Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Instantly, about 70,000 Japanese are killed. We, tro we chose Hiroshima for two reasons. August 6, 45. Everything's happened in the summer of 45. We chose Hiroshima for two reasons. It was seen as an important military industrial site. Harry Truman was insistent that whatever was to be bombed was to have military value. But it was also left previously untouched by earlier firebombing. 
So of all the cities, and we'll look at them in a second, of all the cities that we bombed in Japan with those incendiary bombs, we didn't bomb Hiroshima. We left it. Why drop an atomic bomb on a city that we had never bombed before? So you can see what it does. Because do you recall? This, this is Tokyo. This is Tokyo after firebombing. This is Hiroshima after an atomic bomb. It doesn't look all that different, does it? It doesn't look all that different. So it would be harder for American scientists and military people to see what the atomic bomb did versus what early incendiary bombs did. It might have given the people of Hiroshima a false sense of security because they had yet to be bombed in the war. So on August 6th, we drop a bomb. This, this photograph is kind of interesting. Paul W. Tibbetts. Anybody want to take a guess? He, he a colonel, U.S. Air Force. He was the pilot of the Enola Gay, the, the plane that dropped the, the bomb on Hiroshima. And he autographed, he autographed this photo. What does that tell us? He's absolutely proud of what he did. Back, I want to say it was probably in the 90s, my dad was at a convention somewhere, and he, he met Paul Tibbetts, who was like just sitting at a booth selling posters and signing them to people for people. And so my dad's got a big poster, framed poster, in, in one, of his, uh, one of the rooms at, at our old house um, of the Enola Gay with Paul Tibbetts' signature on it. Um, it looks identical, too. It's the same, same signature. Um, he was proud of it. Was he proud, do you think, of killing 70,000 Japanese immediately? Probably not. But what does he, what does he think the bomb did? Helped end the war. And so Paul Tibbetts can sleep like a baby at night with his understanding that despite having to do this, that doing this maybe saved a quarter of a million American lives and maybe hundreds of thousands or more Japanese lives. Maybe. Or millions of Japanese lives. Japan still didn't surrender. On August 9th, Three days later, we drop a second bomb on Nagasaki, Japan, another city that had previously been untouched by firebombing. So August 6th is Hiroshima, August 9th is Nagasaki. Yes, sir? Uh, did the U.S. intentionally plan ahead of not attacking? Uh, yes. We left, we, left, we, left, we, we knew we were developing a bomb. We left a handful of cities off of bombing target runs. Yes. We drop a bomb on Nagasaki, 40,000 Japanese are killed instantly. Within the next week, Japan will surrender. Yes, sir? Didn't you say that, that Truman dropped the first bomb because in the way they described it, dropping the bomb would end immediately? He, that's what he had hoped, okay. and it didn't. So then he, he, he doesn't know. Does anybody know anything? No. But you think that doing this once will get them to surrender. So of course we drop the bomb and then afterwards we drop a bunch, hundreds of thousands of leaflets over Japan and say, hey, surrender or this can happen again. No surrender. It happens again. Drop more leaflets. This can happen again. Like we can keep doing this. All right, we couldn't keep doing it. We, we had one more bomb ready to go, but we couldn't keep doing it forever. Uh, but we were, we were still developing. By August 14th, Japan surrendered. By August 14th, Japan surrendered. By August 14th, Japan surrendered. Here is a photograph of the Japanese officials signing the terms of surrender. Uh, this is the American Admiral uh, Chester Nimitz. Um, he was the guy in charge of the American fleet in the Pacific, like so at the Battle of Coral Sea and Midway. He's the guy. Uh, and so we accepted Japanese surrender. Why do we win? We gained air superiority. It was the story at the Battle of Britain. It's the story in, in the Pacific. And our air raids, our air raids crippled Japanese production. If we take a look at this next chart. If we take a look at this chart. Here's aircraft production in the United States and Japan from 1939 
throughout the duration of the war. So 1939, remember, the United States is not in the war, but we're making a lot of planes still. We've, we're building our military. We make about 6,000 planes. Japan makes about 4,500. And then 1940, 1941, now we're getting into Lend-Lease territory, and we're starting to open up arms shipments to the Allies. We join the war. We ramp up production. By 1940, you can't buy a 1943 Chevy or a Ford or a Cadillac or anything like that. They didn't exist. There are no domestic automobile productions in 1943 because every American automobile factory was now making airplanes and ships and tanks um, and jeeps and weapons for war. All right? So at we, when we are at peak production by 1944, we make almost 100,000 planes, compared to Japan at peak production making almost 30,000 planes. But then what happens in 1945? We're now close enough to start bombing mainland Japan, and we obliterate their industrial capacity. They can't keep up. This is the story of why the Allies win in Asia, why the United States defeats Japan. Yes, brave soldiers and sailors and Marines, absolutely. The atomic bomb, absolutely. But here, more than anything else, our ability to, in a modern age, outproduce our enemy, and in large part because we were safe. We were protected by oceans on either, on either side of us. Our cities weren't being bombed. We could be at max production throughout the duration of the war. Take a look at this next chart. It's a little harder to see. This is um, naval forces, right? Um, the United States, during the course of the war, um, we would build 124 aircraft carriers. Not all the biggest aircraft. We've got smaller aircraft carriers, too. But we build 124. The Japanese built 18 throughout the duration of the war. Um, <coughs> pardon me. We build um, eight battleships, uh, 48 cruisers, 349 destroyers. The Japanese two battleships throughout the duration of the war. So they're not able to keep up production like the Allies can. And this absolutely turns the tide towards the United States and ultimately our ally Britain. Our island hopping campaign is a successful one. Not only does it get us closer and closer to Japan, but it keeps Japanese troops occupied. Because there's a lot of little islands that we're just avoiding. But the Japanese don't know which islands we're going to go to next. So in times, there's little islands that are filled with Japanese soldiers who will be largely out of the war because we don't take the attack to every single island in the Pacific. So it keeps a lot of Japanese troops occupied. And those incendiary bombs cripple Japanese cities and obviously their production abilities. Questions, comments, concerns? <coughs> 